family plants. They got me. They're taking over. Well, okay, they don't creep on you that fast. This air potato does grow very fast. Invasive exotics do impact our way of life. Oh, it's got me. It's got me. Help. What is an invasive exotic? An invasive exotic is any introduced organism that displaces and disrupts natural communities. Each of us can help keep invasive exotics from spreading. Typically, we humans have introduced invasive exotics, such as this air potato, into areas that they did not exist, and then they really take over. Invasives can be plants, animals, and insects. Many states are under siege, and government agencies and individuals are taking a stand. Welcome to Living Green. On today's show, we're going to take a look at a few invasive exotic species. We're going to learn about the Chinese tallow and the melaleuca tree, wild taro and water hyacinth plants, fire ants, and the Nile monitor lizard. But I know what you're thinking. A lizard? Well, just you wait. First up, though, is an aquatic species, the water hyacinth. We visited a horse farm in Florida that contains a small pond with a water hyacinth problem. The owner has requested a plant control specialist to clear it out. Water hyacinth is a major invasive exotic that is clogging the waterways in the southeast. We met up with Jimbo of Aqua Plant Control to discuss the issue. And what our goals are is to reduce plant populations to get return the aesthetics of the pond back because um, the, the site is used to sell uh, multi-million dollar horses. And uh, when the people come in to purchase horses, they want to make sure that everything looks correct. The plants are serving as a host for mosquito reproduction. And we, we want to get rid of the host so that we reduce the numbers of mosquitoes that we have out here. We don't want to uh, create any kind of equine encephalitis as a result of having these types of plants on the property. In addition, water hyacinth mats prevent oxygen from entering the water by preventing wind action. Low oxygen levels can kill fish. Also, these plants can double their biomass in only seven days, choking waterways and greatly disrupting the ecology of an area. Here you can see that this water has and some of the characteristics and features of it, growth characteristics, is that the, uh, the leaf is round, the stem is bulbous. And if you look at this flower, you'll be able to see some nice coloration uh, within the flower, the deep yellow and the lavender and the light, light purple. conduct two different types of application. One is from a ground application off a of mule and the other will be with an airboat. And what our goals are is to reduce the water hyacinth populations with the use of aquatic herbicides. As far as product selection goes, we can be selective in the type of product that we use and it's all based on the environmental setting in which we're working. In. You do not want water bodies in your area to get to this point. Here's how you can do your part to prevent the spread of water hyacinth. If you have a boat, make sure you remove all the vegetation off your prop and hull. Plants can survive for weeks out of the water. Plus, do not keep water hyacinth even in contained ponds. They do have a way of getting out. These actions will help prevent invasive plants from being introduced into other areas. Otherwise, you might have Jimbo coming around. There you have it, the water hyacinth. Tough little bugger to control. In fact, I don't think Jimbo is ever going to be out of a job. It's going to take a lot of management get this plant under control. Next we're going to look at the Chinese tallow, just as tough, just as invasive as the water hyacinth. But invasive species not only occur in water, many occur on land. What we do in our yards and neighborhoods can impact natural areas. If you plant an invasive exotic in your yard, it can travel miles away and start a new population. In Gainesville, Florida, Chinese tallow trees have escaped from yards and have ended up in a state park called Payne's Prairie. We met up with a park naturalist to discuss more about the spread of invasive exotics. 
Well, our biggest problem is that while this is a state preserve, it's really an urban park. We share a boundary that's common with the city of Gainesville. And so everything that happens in Gainesville quickly comes across the boundary and joins with us, including the invasive plants that people are planting innocently in their backyards. We have a big problem for us with, with Chinese tallow and uh, taro and some other plants. Um, we've been working pretty aggressively at it, but I think we're still probably, um, I think we're still losing the tallow battle. They come into an area and they, they invade and reproduce uncontrolled. They're not in any kind of synchronous control of the community. Um, and they simply destroy, the, they crowd out all the native plants. And when we lose our native plants, of course, we lose our native animals as well. Many tallows are coming into the park by means of a stream. Water passing through your yard picks up the seeds and dumps them into a stormwater drain. This drain hooks up with urban streams in Gainesville that eventually connects up with Payne's Prairie State Park. What can you do if you have Chinese tallows in your yard? We spoke with invasive plant expert Ken Langland. This Chinese tallow is, this is one of the biggest problems on Payne's Prairie and as we talked about earlier these uh, trees are growing in Gainesville and then the seeds are uh, distributed down here into the natural areas on Payne's Prairie. So one of the things that homeowners can do to try to help the natural resources to help uh, Payne's Prairie is to take these trees out of their yard. But they're pretty distinctive and they have the uh, kind of heart-shaped leaves and in the fall they'll be uh, all covered, in the fall through the winter they'll be covered with the white berries which are actually what get dispersed down here. Homeowners have two options if they're handy with a chainsaw or something they can cut these trees down themselves um, or they can hire uh, somebody to come in and cut them for them. The important thing is is just cutting the tree down uh, won't complete the process because the tree will regrow. So they need to treat the stump uh, with a herbicide and there are herbicides that we have tested that a homeowner can buy um, at local hardware stores and garden supplies. IFAS recommends that you at a minimum you wear eye protection, long sleeve shirt, long pants of course and shoes, uh, and a pair of chemical proof gloves. Of course, you always want to be extremely careful when you're cutting a tree down. Uh, we'll cut this tree down at a comfortable level and then cut it down a little closer and then our final cut will make as close to the ground as possible. But after you cut it, brush the sawdust out of the way because that'll absorb herbicide that won't be absorbed into the tree. Again, we've cut it down as close as to the ground as possible without getting our chain into the dirt and we found that we get the most success when we cut the stump uh, as close as possible. Now we've taken this herbicide container and put a tiny little hole in the seal and this way we can concentrate the herbicide right around just inside the bark of the tree. This is, and that's how you want to do it, that's where the living part of the tree is just inside the bark. So we want to just concentrate that around and we're done. There's one less Chinese tallow to threaten Payne's Prairie. We're uh, standing here on the edge of Sweetwater Branch uh, in Payne's Prairie. And Sweetwater Branch is a creek that uh, runs through the city of Gainesville. And one of the problems here on the prairie is that uh, Invasive plants that are uh, in drainages or in people's yards, sometimes in Gainesville, uh, use the water as a uh, means of uh, dispersal. And uh, one of the dominant plants that you see along uh, the edge of Sweetwater Branch here is wild taro. And it's uh, one of the plants that uh, we consider one of the most invasive plants in the state. Uh, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, a group of ecologists and land managers around the state, uh, have made a list of plants that they have recognized to be invasive uh, in lands that they manage. Uh, they have listed about 60 plants that uh, we have recognized uh, are increasing in their populations in the state, reproducing on their own, and um, disrupting, disrupting native plant communities. Remember, invasive plants have ways to escape our yards and neighborhoods. By not planting invasive exotics, you are helping to protect our natural areas. 
In fact, there are many trees that are invasive. If you live in South Florida, you may have heard of one particular species, Melaleuca. We hopped into a car and traveled to South Florida. Melaleuca was introduced to South Florida in the 1900s from Australia. In 1999, estimates indicated that Melaleuca covered over 500,000 acres in South Florida. Growing so dense, it crowds out native vegetation. Plus, it is highly flammable and is a fire hazard. So here we are in this Melaleuca forest, and as you can see, it's pretty dense. And to get through here, if you notice, when you get into the middle of the forest, there, if you look right down here, there's nothing here. There's no growth whatsoever. And it's kind of interesting that they grow so dense and so fast that most of the plants are outcompeted and they don't grow and there's no wildlife habitat. There's not much of anything that's native here within the Melaleuca forest. So how are people battling this invasive exotic? A project in Florida called Tame Melaleuca shows landowners different methods to control Melaleuca. TAME is coordinated by the USDA and the University of Florida. We met up with project coordinator Krista De Silvers and discussed more about Melaleuca control. There are several very characteristic aspects to Melaleuca. Of course, um, one of the common names of Melaleuca is the paper bark tree or the paper tree. And that really um, gives you a hint of what, it, of what it looks like. The leaves are oblong leaves with long parallel veins. The seeds are kept uh, in seed capsules that are produced in clusters. Each capsule can contain hundreds of seeds. So on a full-grown mature Melaleuca tree, you can potentially have millions of seeds on that tree. And that's one of the major problems that, um, that makes Mel Melaleuca such an invasive tree is its prolific seed production um, and holding, retaining the seeds in the, in the canopy and releasing them all at once. And then once those seeds are released, if the, um, if the conditions, the soil conditions are right, the seeds will germinate um, much quicker than any other native seeds in the, um, in the soil, and they'll start growing a lot faster than any of the other um, vegetation around. So Melaleuca quickly uh, then outcompetes the other vegetation, and that's why you end up with those really dense uh, monocultural uh, stands of Melaleuca crowding out all the other vegetation. Landowners do have options. The TAME project shows landowners a number of control methods. But hurry, all kinds of critters are exiting these forests. At this demonstration site, an airplane was used to spray several different kinds of herbicides over a large area. Researchers are keeping track of how this large-scale spraying impacts Melaleuca and other species of plants. They focus on which plants are killed and how much regrowth occurs after spraying. As you can see, many of the plants are brown and lack leaves. To minimize the impact on non-target plants, aerial spraying is only used on large properties that contain lots of Melaleuca trees. We are at one of the treatment plots where trees were cut down with machetes and chainsaws. Even after cutting down the trees, some of the stumps are sprouting again. To stop this new growth, project coordinators are releasing two insects that love to eat growing Melaleuca trees. The insects that have been released are from Australia. One insect is the Melaleuca psyllid, a very small, sap-sucking insect that generates a white residue on leaves. The other insect is the Melaleuca weevil. Both insects only feed on Melaleuca, concentrating their efforts on the growing leaves and buds of young Melaleuca trees. These sap-sucking insects stunt the growth of these trees and make them less likely to flower. Reduced flowering means they cannot produce seeds, and seeds are the primary way that Melaleuca spreads. For homeowners, they can cut down Melaleuca trees and then release weevils and psyllids. To find out more about controlling Melaleuca trees, and if you want to obtain some weevils and psyllids, visit the TAME website.